we have a friend who has had like chronic kidney stones, like just in the last year, he's had kidney stones three times. And it's been interesting because, you know, it's like, well, I don't know what he's eating. I don't, you know, well, we were in this conversation with him because he was asking us questions and Scott found out that he's been taking, and this goes back to, you know, when everybody's trying to do principles over pandemic, hopefully that, mm -hmm. you know, when you're taking zinc for, um, to shore up your immune system when, you know, getting sick or whatever, he, they kind of, he and his wife both kind of felt like, okay, well, we don't want to get sick with COVID. So we're just going to keep taking zinc and a couple other things like forever. And yeah. I know you talked about like, we take it for a certain time. We don't take it forever. And so, um, of course we went down, Scott went down the rabbit hole. He's like, I'm concerned that maybe this excess zinc could be causing kidney stones because we saw a lot of research on that. And he, so it was our next <laughs> Dr. B asked Dr. B question is this, is this, is, can it really be a problem? Yeah. Yeah. Um, good question. Yes. Overdoing it with any nutrient can lead to issues, right? Not necessarily kidney stone issues, but um, all the vitamins or most, I should say, have potential for toxicity when you overdo it. And obviously we can be deficient in all, you know, there's deficiency risks for all of them too, because they're needed for optimal physiology. And so, you know, zinc, yes, during the COVID time, zinc rose to the top in people's consciousness because it is very important for an immunity. It's also important for the bone health conversation that we just had. It's important for genetic expression, which, you know, covers the entire physiology. Uh, it's important for, as a cofactor for many enzymatic reactions body-wide. So we do need it, but we can definitely overdo it. And if you've got zinc toxicity, one sign uh, or symptom of that is nausea. So I'd be interested if this if this guy's had nausea or, or vomiting at all too, mm -hmm. um, because that that can be a symptom. Maybe not in everybody, but it is a, a common one for zinc toxicity. <clears throat> so yes, you can overdo it with zinc. You can test zinc in the blood easily. There's serum zinc testing. Uh, there's red blood cell zinc testing. So you can look at those and see what is a person's zinc level. And then as with many vitamins, if not most, zinc occurs in a ratio with a lot of different things. And a key one is the zinc to copper ratio. And if you get too much zinc, that could promote a, you know symptoms of a relative copper deficiency. So you might say, okay, well, how, you know, once you've overdone it, how do you reduce the zinc? Well, you want to stop, you know, overdoing it with the zinc intake. So only get the zinc that's coming from your diet and, uh, you know, skip the oysters for a while. Mm -hmm. If you're an oyster fan, cause they're the highest food source of zinc. And at the same time, you could choose to up your copper status and, or take a copper supplement in order to help balance that, that seesaw between those two. Okay. So you could, you know, you could low, you could balance it out the ratio by lowering zinc and or raising copper. Um, does that make sense? Oh yeah. That's great. Thank you. And then from a kidney stone standpoint, you also want to be aware of pH because uh, the kidney is like a net alkaline pH. And so the most alkaline foods, again, in the diet are going to be the veggies for us. So patients with kidney stones want to look at, you know, the acid, acidity in their diet. And if they're eating a standard American diet or a SAD diet, then that's a very acidic diet because it's grains, it's the dairies, two very acidic foodstuffs. Uh, protein's going to raise the acidity. So if you're carnivore, um, you know, that's a consideration, uh, you know, all the processed stuff, the beer, you know, anything that's basically not fruits and veggies is going to be, uh, and especially fruits, is, or excuse me, veggies is going to be um, pushing you potentially more acidic. So raising the 
alkalinity of the person's diet can be helpful there. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does that also um, stand for uh, bladder uh, UTIs and stuff? The alkaline? Yes. So hold on. Let me make this more legible than it was. Net alkaline. Uh oh. I picked a disappearing pen. There we go. So net alkaline. Okay. So then, yes, does, how does that, how does pH apply to um, urinary tract? Good question. So let's change colors for that. So how does pH apply to urinary tract infection? So for the urinary tract, we'd like a, a again, and we've made a video on this. It's been a couple of years though, but we want a, a net alkaline pH. Uh, so an ideal or an optimal urine pH would be an 8.0. I routinely see people on their urinalysis where their pHs are 5.5 or 6-ish. Okay. And just for those who aren't aware, 7 is neutral. Going this way up to 14 is the highest pH. You're heading alkaline. Going down to zero is the lowest pH, that's acidic. Okay, so seven is neutral. Our blood, our blood pH is maintained very tightly between 7.35 and 7.45. Okay, if you go outside either lower than 7.35 or higher than 7.45 in the blood, you're not going to live long. So maintaining the pH in that tight window is so important that the body has three different buffer systems to keep the blood pH in that range. The urine pH can vary much more widely. The urine pH, um, I've seen, you know, down in the fours up to the 8.5 range. Uh, and it'd probably go higher, but I, I haven't used urine strips that measure it that high above that. So, um, Realize what we're talking about. We're talking about urine pH, not blood. Blood pH doesn't change much. And so that impacts, you know, if you've heard of alkaline water filtration systems and different multi-level marketing alkaline water units, and they'll say, hey, you have to change your pH to be healthy and all this. And, and that's not wrong, but you have to understand drinking alkaline water isn't changing your blood pH because the body's doing so much to maintain that. It could put stress on your buffer systems uh, that you don't want. So like if you drank a, a 14 pH water, which would be super alkaline, now the body has to buffer that down to a seven. So that's taken a lot of, you know, that's taken a lot of work from the body. Just like if you drank, you know, a pH of two Coca-Cola, which is like battery acid in your stomach. Now the body has to buffer that acid and bring it up. So we don't want to swing too far alkaline or acidic um, because that's going to tax our buffer systems and we're, it's not really impacting our blood pH level. Those things might change your urine pH level, but if you want to alkalize your urine pH, again, focus more on veggies. Um, if you wanted to do it kind of acutely, you could use uh, potassium bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate to alkalize your, your urine. 